please put your hands together, Boston, like only Boston can, for Ms. Jennifer Boston! Hey, welcome to Boston. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Have you, have you, uh, I don't know, do you eat lobster? Have you, like, engaged in any of the local foods or anything? I do eat lobster. I have not yet eaten lobster in Boston, but I'll put that on the list for tonight. Right now. It's on the list. I mean, right after this panel, in fact. Just happened. Someone yes. back there is like, it's on the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, before we dive in, of course, guys, there's a microphone right there. You can get in line with your questions right now and, uh, and get ready with those. Uh, but I'm going to start. Um, first off, recently you attended, I think just in the last week, the uh, Badass Women Dinner. I did. Yeah. Yeah. You're a badass woman. <laughs> I guess I am. You guess you are. I'm going to totally embrace that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got badass barrettes that said badass. Merchandise the badass we, yeah, badassery. We, we really went for the badassness. Yes. Well, you, you also, you attended with um, uh, Melissa, who we all know as Supergirl, who you also directed, correct? Yes, and Sundogs. I love yeah. Melissa. We were, it was a fun week, because I felt like there were just a few events in the same week where I got to see people over and over again. So I got to see Melissa at the Holly Shorts event, and then I saw her. There was also this, um, there was a female producer in Los Angeles, uh, Jennifer Klein, who has for many, many years, way before Me Too and Time's Up and all that, has had a gathering of all women in the industry. And so she had that party and I saw Melissa at that and then I also saw Melissa there. So yeah. I got to see her a bunch. Well, you, uh, as I mentioned, you just directed an episode, well, not just, but uh, you directed an episode of Euphoria. Um, yeah, so you can give it up for Euphoria. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed by your directing and producing career. And one of the things that I find fascinating is, like, when you set out to direct, you didn't just take on a project. You, you launched a whole darn uh, production company. I did, yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. It's like um, part of the reason I was able to maintain so much creative control on Sundogs was because uh, I did it under the banner of my production company instead of handing it over to the entirely to someone else. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to get into the minutia of why it shakes out that way. Um, but part of the reason I was lucky enough to be in that position is because I was on Once Upon a Time for so many years and I was on House for so many years and um, I, was tr I tried to be very careful financially and things like that to be able to put myself in a position where I could invest in IP and I could invest in owning uh, content that I could create. And, and when you do that, you give yourself a lot more creative power. So. Um, I just wanted to start knowing that what I put in the world was what I really believed in instead of feeling like I had to compromise. Yeah, well, and, and now, like, you're in this position where not only could you produce and direct your own film, and uh, you now are able to foster other talent via the production company. Is that something that you're already kind of starting to do? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's everything, it's interesting because when you're on the production side of things, everything takes forever. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and it, you know, when you're acting, you can kind of do multiple projects at a time if you can work your schedule out because you work these days, but you don't work those days. But when you're producing and directing, it's all day, every day. And when you're developing, um, one day can be a great day for a project and then it sits still for months and then you have another great day for that project and then you have a bad day for that project. You know, it's, it's weird. There's, there are these long stretches of silence sometimes when you're developing things. Um, so, you know, I, I have things, I have a couple articles that I own that I am placing at different places and we're trying to find the right writers for them and things like that. So, yes, along those lines, um, you know, I'm trying to find young writers to match with some of the material and um, there's just a lot of rolling hill, rolling balls up hills, big, big balls up big hills. That sounded wrong, but yeah. you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> like, like the Sisyphean uh, task, right? That's. It's, I'm yeah. tired. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's like. That <laughs> metaphor just didn't quite work out. <laughs> it's we followed. I think we followed on that. Um, no, it's fascinating. I could pick your brain all day about that, but I, actually, what I'm going to do is there's some awesome people in line with some questions, so we'll dive right in to some audience Q and A uh, with this young person. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi, my name's Emma, and what was it like working on Once Upon a Time? Well, I have a question for you. How old are you? Seven. So, are you named after Emma? No. No. Oh, all right. <laughs> Just wishful thinking. You're very cute. Um, it was great playing Emma. She's, she's a really strong, smart um, woman who has had a hard life in certain ways and has had a, a wonderful life in certain ways. And so I think she's... 
We're being re- interrupted by God, apparently. She's <laughs> all see loading docks. This is good information to have, guys. Um, but that that said, uh, continue. Uh, it's basically she's a you know she's sort of a wonderfully complicated, real person, and um, hopefully you enjoyed watching her, and and I really liked I really liked getting to bring her to life. Thank you, Emma. Bye. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, with this uh, long, rich tradition of uh, Disney characters, you got to embody a character that kind of broke the mold a little bit um, and was able to be a little bit stronger, more dynamic, yeah, it confident. Yeah, it was a very interesting moment in television because uh, just around that time, we were just we were a little ahead of the curve in terms of people really being interested in really strong women. Um, I mean, not that people aren't interested in strong women, but the, I guess the, the industry realizing that people were interested right. in strong women. And... Um, before Once Upon a Time, you've never seen a Disney princess with a weapon in her hand ever, his, ever in the history of Disney. And it was a huge deal uh, in the pilot that they wanted to put a sword in Snow White's hand, and there was a big argument over it, and um, we were supposed to, at least the story the way I was told it, um, we were supposed to shoot that scene with and without her holding the sword, and we just only shot it with her with the sword and didn't really give them the option. And... Um, <laughs> I mean, that's for Eddie. That's on it. Eddie and Adam were the geniuses who made that decision, you know. So that's I can't take credit for that, but I supported it, um, and and people went crazy for it, obviously. And and that really, I guess you don't realize sometimes how it might seem like one moment or one scene or one decision, but there was a huge domino effect of the way that we continued to portray these Disney princesses and and empower them and give them agency and give them the weapons to defend themselves and stand up for themselves and to take care of not just themselves, but the people that they loved and the people around them. Um, And so it was really kind of a special moment uh, to be a part of a show that was really a part of a movement that was happening on a much larger level across the board, I think, on on television at the time. Yeah, it was a bold decision. And I mean, and, and let's face it, like, if you wait for other people to make changes, it doesn't happen. Like, you have to... If you want to see changes, you have to make the changes, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next question. Hi, how are you? Hi, uh, Jen. I know this is kind of like a tricky question, but what can you tell us about your character on This Is Us? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just that I'm on no it. No spoilers. No spoilers. I'm there. I'm on it. That's all I can say. I mean, really, it's really, I'm, I'm always asking what I can say, and that's literally it. It, I'm there. My hair is brown. I can't hide that. <laughs> it's a highly, in you could say like, and I'm all CGI or something, you know, like, uh, but it's like it's a highly secretive project because it's so popular. And wouldn't you rather just be surprised when you think, find out? Sorry to interrupt you. I do think I don't know when, but I know uh, Dan Fogelman did an interview recently where he said within the next two weeks you would know more. So whatever that yes. means. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That should be soon, because that was probably five days ago that he said that. Um, and I have seen a trailer that he showed me for season four, which is very exciting and gave me chills. Um, so maybe, maybe that's what's coming. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We're excited. Know. We're super excited. <laughs> well, let, let's ask this then. Um, other than watch this space for updates, but like stepping into, you know, when you look at Once Upon a Time, when you look at House, like, uh, you know, you you originated with those with those series, but stepping into a series that's already established, um, what kind of dynamic is that like for you as a performer? I, it, honestly, I think it has to do with every individual show, and everyone here is wonderful. I, I, I've actually never worked on a set that is this healthy, functional, loving, supportive. Um, I, I, I'm sort of blown away. Um, and it's, it's really refreshing, and I feel so welcomed, and I, I feel like I've always been there, but that's a testament to the cast, the crew, the, the writers, the creator, the, you know, every, it's, it's everyone, and I do, I do really believe that that starts from the top down, so I really give Dan Fogelman credit for that, because he sets the tone, and he yeah. decides, you know, who stays, and um, it's, it really is an an astoundingly healthy, loving environment. And that's very, very unusual in this industry. I, I, wish, I wish that weren't the truth, but it is the truth yeah. um, in terms of the industry. So um, they're, they're doing a lot of things really right over there. 
All right, cool. All right, cool. Hi, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? I'm peachy. Good. Um, so Jen, you are in an industry that's very much in the public eye. And that obviously opens you up to a lot of criticism. And you know, everyone's their own worst critic, but how are you able to take criticism and negativity from others without it affecting you or hindering your growth as an artist? I, I, I think, you know, it's something that evolves over time. I, I think it used to affect me more when I was younger and as t time has gone on, I just don't look at it. I just don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't like everybody. You guys don't like everybody. You know what I mean? Like everybody has their things where there's things you like, there's things you don't like. I don't publicly announce it when I don't like something the way some people do, but you know, it's like everyone's entitled to their opinion and, and you don't know if someone's had a bad day or you don't know if someone is in a bad mood or if they got hurt in some way or, um, you know, there's that quote of like, there's, there's no one you wouldn't love if you knew their story. And I kind of just look at it all that way and I, I, don't, I don't really take it on. I think it's harder when I see people I really care about get attacked because that, that I get more defensive and riled up on behalf of someone else. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it's just, it's been years and years of sort of uh, my own sort of self work, I guess, and being surrounded by people I really love and people who are honest with me, because I know then that if there is something I need to change or work on, the people who are honest with me are going to tell me. I don't need to hear that from someone I don't know. I need to hear that from someone I do know. Right. Um, and I trust that the people who I'm close to would tell me. So I just don't believe people unless I trust them. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Jen. Uh, I recently saw Batman Hush. You did a great job in it. Everybody did a really good job. And I was wondering, what, how do, how, what did you think of the whole voiceover aspect of acting? And would you be interested in doing more of that? Yeah, I love it. It's really fun. I mean, it's, it's an interesting way to feel very, um, oh, gosh, I guess brave in a way, because you're just in a little room alone, figuring something out and trying things. And I was really in awe of how, um, how carefully planned everything is and how thoughtful the directors have to be in those situations because it, I under, obviously from being a director I know how much you have to plan and work and, and strategize and design things and whatever but when it's an animated film the, there's no there's no experimenting it is exactly what you imagine you know it's like frame by frame by frame moment by moment uh, performance by performance and I really had to rely on the director because I was alone in a room I never even met uh, the guy who plays Batman. I've never spoken to him in person. So, uh, you know, you're trying to figure out how to hope that what you do creates chemistry and is the right vibe. And, and so much of that is just really relying on the director. Um, so I was, I was really in awe of, of what he was able to do with all of that. But it's fun, you know, once you put aside not really having the actors in front of you, you get to experiment, you get to try things, and you get to fail miserably and have no one know that because it just goes away, you know? So um, I think that it's a really fun way to expand creatively, and I'd love to do it for other characters. I think that'd be really fun. Thank you. As a director, are you constantly taking notes with each role that you do as a performer and you're working with other directors? Are you sort of filing away things that these other directors do to say, actually, I kind of like, like that little tip. I like that yeah. little method. Yeah, I think you naturally do that, you know? And then I also think a lot of it is just kind of picking up how someone manages things technically, you know? There's no matter, even if I had directed a thousand movies, there would be something I hadn't done in a scene. And when you see someone do it, you go, oh, that's an interesting, oh, I never would have thought to do it that way. Or I would have put that on a different piece of equipment. Or, But, you know, you just, inevitably, that's kind of the beauty of this, of this particular art form is that there's sort of endless opportunities to change things up and, and kind of add to the tool set from the things that you see other people do. Are you able to stay in the moment of like whatever job you're working on? Like, or are you, when you're acting, are you kind of thinking, ah, I, I wish I was directing right now? Or when you're directing, you're like, man, I. <laughs> I would rather just be acting right now. <laughs> like, you know. um, I, when I'm directing, I'm really so like hyper-focused on whatever I'm dealing with, and there's usually 16,000 fires at yeah. the time. So it, I don't even know if I get all the way through my brain to the point of thinking that. Um, as an actor, now it, it just feels like such a fun treat when all I have to do is go to work and really worry about only one person. Um, get your mark, say your line. Yeah, and, and also I, I feel like I'm much, I'm much more... 
uh, able to, I, I, I have an ability to give to the director more than I think I could before because I understand the process on a different level. So I, I have a much deeper trust in the whole process. And I think it makes me a little bit more freer as an actor and um, more willing to kind of stretch in different directions and give the director the options that they might want eventually in the edit. Um, so I think that's good. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think when I'm acting, for the most part, I'm able to just give myself over to it and enjoy it. Really, the only times that I've found it frustrating now that I have been directing is when I feel like someone hasn't done their homework and and isn't really servicing the story in a visual way. And that's very that's when it becomes hard for me to divorce myself yeah. from knowing what I know. And, and I still do. I mean, I keep myself in check and I keep myself in place. But mentally, I'm kind of like, oh, man, what a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Hi, how are you? How's it going? So first of all, I want to give you a compliment. Uh, I loved you as Zoe in How I Met Your Mother. I think was nobody could have done a better job. Thank you. <laughs> And now my question is actually about Once Upon a Time. So when you heard Emma had to be the dark one, how did, how did you feel? I was so excited. I mean, you have to remember, we do what we're doing 18 hours a day, every day for years, right? So if someone literally told you, you have to wear that outfit every day for 18 hours a day for the next six years, and you're going to say basically kind of the same thing every day, all day for the next six years, and don't you dare think you're gonna do anything else, because I'm gonna be really mad at you. You'd be like, wow, you know, you're going to get a ways into that. You'd be like, wow, I'm really doing the same thing again. So when someone comes to you and they're like, you're going to actually be a badass and we're going to change the whole thing up and you're going to have no regrets and you're going to not be worried about other people. You're not going to have the weight of the world on your shoulders and you're going to get to expand this character and find corners of her that have never been found before. It was very exciting from an acting perspective to um, feel like I was going to, I was getting a chance to get to know Emma in a whole new way and uh, spread my wings creatively a little bit. So how did you prepare for that? Like, what, what did you do personally to prepare to become, you know, evil Emma Swan? We, well, I worked fairly closely with Eddie and Adam over it because it was, we were creating a villain that didn't exist in the, in the lexicon of Disney villains, you know? So um, we talked about everything down to every detail of her look and uh, what her motivations and all of those things. I mean, we, we spent hours and hours and hours going back and forth with images that we shared because we had no idea what she was going to look like initially. We had no, no clue. Um, so all of that was a collaboration of different images that we sent back and forth and things that I would send and say, well, what about this? And then they'd say, well, we like this, but we don't like that. And they'd send me stuff and I'd say, I like this, but I don't like that. You know, so it was a real, it was a true collaboration. And then I spent, um, I went to the New York Public Library where they have an incredible service where they will help you pull research from their um, from all of their books and I told them what was going on and I told them the character I was creating and um, they did a really deep dive with me where they pulled tons and tons of articles and chapters on um, anything swan related in mythology and fairy tale material and um, so I had probably 300, 400 pages of research that they gave me that I went through and you know and it's interesting because like you can read all that and it maybe seem like the tiniest things that come from it but those things make a big difference in terms of finding keys into someone um, and one of the things it's a while ago now so I I could be misquoting this just because I, it's not the freshest research in my mind but um, there's something about actual black swans that they I think they're the only swans that have 60 feet of flight like they can, most swans can't fly and black swans can fly for 60 feet and so I thought it was a really interesting metaphor that in her darkness she could fly for 60 feet. You know, the idea that her, she was sort of liberated from her burdens for a little bit, but it was only for a moment, the same way, you know, 60 feet is really only a moment. Uh, so it's things like that, right? So it might seem like a little thing, but, um, you know, you kind of add those little things up and you start to find the core of something new. And, um, you know, and she still had to be Emma deep down, so we had to kind of f find our way away from her and our way back to her. All right, thank you. Do you do that level of research for most roles? Or Everything. Was <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, I you're mean, a that's research the, nerd. The, yeah, that's par probably partly why I became a director because it it's I naturally sort of treat characters the way I treat a whole project. But um, you know, I always say it's like you know a character playing a character for one day or six years is it starts with the same amount of research. Yeah. You know, it's just, just because I was someone only for a day doesn't mean I didn't have to build a whole person. So, right. um, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of thought and research that goes into that. That's interesting. Hi. 
Hi, so my question is about uh, what is your process uh, choosing a role or direct a movie or TV show? Uh, like, uh, if, is there some characteristic or something? I wish I had uh, a definitive way to do that because it would make my life so much easier. Um, I really, I, I have said this before, but it's true. There really is a little bit of romance to it. You know, you don't know why something catches your eye. You don't know why you fall in love with it. Sometimes you fall in love with something that's terribly flawed, but you still love it and feel like you have to do it. Um, you know, so there is something kind of inexplicable about it. Um, and I definitely feel like I, ha I, I do feel like I need to feel like I can't not do it. You know, it, it can't just feel like, yeah, I mean, I could. It, it feels like it needs to be like, I have to do this. I can't not do this. So um, that usually is the most defining characteristic. But there is not a checklist. I, I certainly, especially with directing and producing, I, I have people close to me that I have read things and sort of see if they have similar reactions to what I have. Um, I definitely kind of vet the people that would be involved and see if it's people that I really want to spend a lot of time collaborating with because you really do end up spending a lot of time with these people so you have to feel like you're going to make something that you're seeing eye to eye about. Um, but yeah, there's no kind of set way. It's, it, it, every project has a different, a different journey. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, because Emma has, happens to love a guy who has guy liner and went from bad to good, how do you think she would in interact with Aramon from Albion and the Enchanted Stallion? Okay, I never saw the movie. I know I read it a long time ago and I was in it, but who, which one was he? He was the main bad guy's son, like the general's son. Did he also have guy liner? Who played him? Yes. What actor played him? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Aha, the tables are turned. No. I, uh, you guys have to remember, like, I literally right now have five films in my head that I could potentially direct. I, my brain is a little bit on overload. I don't, Albion was a while ago. I don't know. I'm so sorry. How would, uh, how would my, I don't know. I loved working with Callan. He was great. Yeah. Captain Hook's awesome. Super into his guy liner. He really pulled it off. Uh, the actor was Liam McLinter. I don't know how to say his name. Oh, was he kind of gross? Like he ate food all the time and stuff? Was he that guy? Um, he was the guy with like the feathers on his hair. I don't know. I never saw it. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this? Let's, you know, like as uh, when you step into a role, are you excited to kind of play opposite these eccentric characters or kind of big larger than life characters or? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's always fun to have different things going on, you know? I mean, it's. Sometimes I'm the sort of straight guy responding to the big character, and sometimes I'm the funny one. You know, it's like you kind of fall into a different category with different situations. You know, it's like, um, you know, Emma was always very kind of sarcastic and understated about things, and, uh, you know, a giant snow monster could be plowing through, and she's like, oh, man, what a day. You know, like, <laughs> she just didn't really, <laughs> she was never like, oh, my God. She was like, oh, yeah, well, there's another giant snow monster. Let's deal with that. Um, so, you know, everybody has a different reaction to different things. Um, Do you have the desire as a performer to kind of like, and maybe, you know, maybe you have, do like the over the top, totally wild, unhinged character? Yeah, uh, yes, yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know that I've gone all the way there with that. I definitely, the closest to that I felt like was in Superfly, actually, where I played just like a terrible bad guy who was, um, you know, a little bit on the edge of over the top. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Hi. What, what's your question? Um, what got you into directing and acting? Well, I started, I, how long are we here? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I started acting when I was pretty much your age. I was really young. I just really, I don't know why, but I really wanted to do it. And I was always excited by the idea of um, creating different characters. And uh, it was something that just was a really natural progression in my life. And then I have spent so much of my life acting and on sets and, and around all of it. And I directed some theater in high school and then college. And um, eventually, I felt like I was around the technical elements of things so much that I could ask a lot of questions with all the people that I worked with to sort of start to learn how I could direct uh, television and film. And um, I started really studying it and um, 
diving into reading about it and watching the movies that I really loved. And um, I just used all the resources I had around me to learn about it as much as possible. And then I, I started putting things together and actually making them. So that was kind of how I transitioned into directing. Thank you. Are you satisfied with that answer? <laughs> yeah? She didn't look entirely satisfied. No, I was answer. really worried that I wasn't yeah. quite enough. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hi, I really like the, um, the musical from um, Once Upon a Time. I'm just curious, how did Robert Carlyle get out of singing? That's what I want to know. You know, I don't, I don't know. It, that never occurred to me, but you're right. I think you're right. I don't know. Maybe they asked him and he said no. I, I have no idea. I, I, I never even noticed he didn't sing. It's like, is saying no an option? We can say no? It's always an option for Robert Carlyle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Jen. Congratulations on a great career. I'm really curious about um, what it's been like to work with a Manny and what your favorite role historically has been. To work with what? Say again. The Manny, Kevin, and This Is Us. I oh. can't talk about This we Is Us. We can't talk about it. I can't talk about who I've worked with. Okay. Yeah. But do you have a, a follow-up question? Sure. What your favorite role has been? Um, I, you know, it's, it's always tricky because I love all the characters and I, I have such a, they do all feel like old friends, you know. Um, but I do have like a really special place in my heart for Tess from Warrior. I feel like that was like a really special film in my life and working with Joel Edgerton was really special and, and Gavin O'Connor was a great director and, um, you know, th there was just something about that story in particular that really hit home for me and, um, yeah, it was, a, it was just a really good creative experience for me. What was your least favorite role? Oh, it's a follow-up. All right. Uh, well, I mean, like, seems sort of like, I'm going to bad cop this a little bit. Saying what your least favorite role is, whatever it is, there was probably a lot of people that worked on that project, yes. and they, it wasn't their least favorite job. So, <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to give also, her a pass I mean, I wouldn't have said yes to anything that I didn't love. You know what I mean? Like, it, and that doesn't mean everything went exactly as, as to plan, and it doesn't mean... I necessarily loved every choice that I made. I mean, as, as an artist, you always look at things and you wish you could change something or you feel like there's more you could have done. And um, I don't think you ever look at something and go like, yeah, that's exactly right. You're always, you know, you're, you're hard on yourself. But, um, but I, I honestly wouldn't even say that there's anything that jumps to mind that I'm like, oh, I didn't like that. Like, in terms of the character and who the person was, I feel like, I feel very lucky that I've gotten to play really interesting women. Okay. Cool. And wait for September 24th. Oh, is that what it airs? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Everyone keeps asking me. I don't know. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. What's your question? Um, hi, Jen. Um, I met you yesterday, uh, and my question is just kind of fun. So I really liked it in Once Upon a Time when Emma ha had her arms like this, and then there was that white magic coming out of her hands. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the process? Like, what was it like filming those scenes? And then were there special effects? What was it like? Oh, yeah, there's all, it's all special effects. You just do all sorts of stuff with your hands all by yourself out there. Imagination. You put big wind machines on you, and you wave your arms around, and then some really magical visual effects guy makes you look real cool. <laughs> and Thank you, you just feel very grateful for that person. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it, it, you know, and he said imagination, but I, I would imagine you have to, like, trust the, the process enough that they're not going to make you look goofy. Yeah, and then, you know, I mean, I'm making light of it a little bit, but you do have to really, really commit to it. Yeah. I mean, you have to really commit to it, because if you don't really commit to it, then you will look silly on the other side. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Hi. Hi. What was your favorite scene to do on Once? Wow. You did a lot of scenes. I did, I did do a lot of scenes. I, 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 I kind of always go back to this, but it is true. I really loved doing the musical, the whole episode. I, I just thought that um, it was really fun to bring music into the show, and I liked the way that they incorporated it, and a lot of us did grow up doing musical theater, so for us it was just a fun way to nerd out a little bit on being musical theater kids. Thank you. Uh, before this next question, I'm, I am curious. I do want to talk a little bit about um, the report, which is, which is coming up. Um, I mean, this is an intense kind of movie, and um, it's definitely all drama. Uh, is this the kind of role that intrigues you right now in your career? Is this the kind of thing that you would like to, you know, focus on a little bit more? Um, 
you know, it, I got involved in the report because Scott Burns, who wrote it and directed it, is a good friend of mine, and um, he, I wanted to support him in any way possible. Um, I, the script was outstanding, and Scott's so smart, and he's such a lovely guy, and he's so talented in so many different ways, and so, um, you know, I always just want to be a part of things that I think are special, and I knew this was special, and so, um, he was trying to figure out where it made sense to put me in the film, and he really wanted me to play this character, Callan Krauss, who's a real woman who was the, um, the attorney for the CIA at the time of the, um, at the time when this film happens. And uh, it was one of those ones where, like, even though I'm only in a couple scenes of the film, it was a lot of research because I was I was having to play a real person, a real person who has like some very particular. Um, ticks and quirks and the way she speaks and so then there was also you know do we do an actual imitation or do we kind of tone it back you know I think that always comes down to the taste of the director and what ends up feeling the most natural in the moment I'm, I'm, I'm here it's good information super important Did you get all that Okay. I'll see loading dock is busy I'll see yeah I know it's, it's a place busy. to be man at 530 yeah <laughs> hi Hi, um, when you're on house, how hard was? <clears throat> sorry, sorry. Okay. How hard was it to memorize the medical terms? Ah. You know, I think it's just something that it's like uh, it's like anything. It's like a muscle. You know, you kind of develop it over time. It's something that initially, I think, it was tough on all of us, um, and it's definitely harder than memorizing just kind of normal conversation because you do want to make sure that you've pronounced everything correctly. And there's so many distractions when you're filming that. I don't even know how to begin explaining how many distractions there are when you're filming, but you have to be able to deliver and be so precise and so accurate with all those distractions. So, you know, initially I think it was a little bit harder, um, but over time you kind of develop that muscle and it's, it's something that you, you know, get used to and something that becomes almost like learning another language, you know? Um, and then when I, and I did the pilot for CBS this year, um, and had to go back to doing some medical words. We do these scenes where it was just kind of like spewing medical words and I was like, oh my God. I was like, no, I just, trust me, I did this for a long time. <laughs> you know, it was, it was sort of just like came right back. You know, it was like riding a bike or something. But it's, it, yeah, it's definitely like a muscle. Thank you. Thank you. So we are running out of time. I'm gonna get through you final four people, okay? But please keep it really succinct. And we're gonna move through this fast, okay? Okay. So my question is, you've gotten the opportunity to play a lot of incredible women. If you had the opportunity to bring to life a woman from a story or to retell the story of a woman in history, who would that be? It's a really good question, actually, and I don't really know. Um, I, I was recently kind of talking with my sister-in-law about this because she has... Um, She's a magazine called O. Eleonora, where it's a digital magazine, and she researches women from history that were kind of forgotten, and she then photographs a woman from her town, which is San Antonio, who does something similar as the woman from history, which is a really kind of cool concept. That's interesting. So I've learned a lot about a lot of women that I didn't know anything about that she's researched sort of through watching O. Eleonora. Um, I don't know. I'd have to give it more thought. It's not something I would want to say uh, in a flippant way, only because those things always come back to me, and then someone says, but you said. <laughs> um, so I can't give you a definitive answer there. Um, but I think there's a lot of women... What I would say is I think there's a lot of women that are none of us would have heard of that I think would be re really interesting to know their story. You know, it's, it's not the ones that we happen to know about. It's the, the millions of them that um, have done incredible things throughout history, but history refused to give them credit, you know? So I'd, I'd love to find women like that whose stories I'd like to tell. Okay, great, thank you. Right on, thank you, good question. Hi. Hi. Who are a few Disney or fairy tale characters you wish made it on Once Upon a Time and why? Which ones were we missing? Give me like a, give me a multiple choice. Oh my God, I didn't think of that. Oh. Uh, Star, Wars. Star Wars, someone yeah. said Star Wars, that's a good one. Cause that was like not quite Disney when we started but then became Disney cause they bought them. Um, How cool would that be? I'm gonna buy Star Wars. Uh, the, I mean then you technically, if you're gonna go there you technically have all the Marvel characters. I know, too. and Marvel. And Muppets. And Muppets. I mean, Kermit and Miss Piggy. I think yeah. that was a story waiting to be told. That was a story waiting to be told. Uh, Jack and Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of them. Uh, I would go with Star Wars. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. 
Hi, I just want to compliment you on um, your acting ability, and I know you always get this. However, I'm just going to ask you something really silly. If you could travel back in time and have dinner with anyone, who would it be, and what question would you ask? Um, okay, well, that question, the answer to that question would probably change to ba based on whatever's going on in my life in the moment. But right now, I'm reading Team of Rivals about Abraham Lincoln. Good book, Joyce Carol Oates, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'd say Abraham Lincoln. What question would you ask? And I would say, uh, how scared were you for your entire time that you were president, and how did you manage your fear? Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good one. What would you serve him? Like, or what would you guys eat? What would we eat? Um, you know, the book really hasn't talked about what he likes to eat, but I, I feel like I might get there. I don't, I don't, I yeah. don't know. Sorry, I, I don't know. Uh, Cobbler. I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't know. I don't know I what don't he likes to eat either. I don't know if he was either. a big dessert guy. Like, I don't know. He doesn't strike me as like a, a sweet tooth person. No? Like, I bet he liked salty things. But yeah. that's just my guess based on well, the first 100 pages of Team Spoiler, of they get to it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hi. <laughs> I don't know. Hi, Jen. Um, I always love the scenes between Rumpel and Emma because they're such an iconic hero-villain duo. What was your favorite scene to film with Robert Carlyle? Uh, Robert and I had some really fun stuff once I became the dark one. Like that, I feel like, is when we started working together more. Uh, there's some great photos of us just drenched in the forest, sitting on apple box, like reading side by side, dressed as two dark ones. Um, <laughs> Uh, there was that scene where I like come out of the weird molten lava-y black tar thing that makes me into the dark one. Remember that? When I was like in the feathery thing for a while, right before I caught all the arrows. I don't know, all I know is I cried all the time. I just cried. I was like, am I crying today? Yeah, I'm crying today. I'm crying tomorrow. I'm really evil, but I cry a lot. Uh, anyway. That was a fun scene because I like, came, I don't know, I remember I came out of that and it was just like this really heated, I don't remember the scene completely now, but I just remember it was like a real back and forth between his character and my character where we both kept changing it up and kind of didn't know what to expect from each, each other from moment to moment and that's always really fun as an actor. So we had, we had a good time in that scene. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, guys, uh, we reached the end of the panel, however, are you heading back to your I am going to my okay. table. She's going back to her table, so you guys still say, have time to go say hi. Meanwhile, check out uh, Jen's episode of Euphoria. Keep an eye out for the report opening in November. And also, uh, This Is Us is on the way. And uh, apparently, there's going to be some news and a trailer coming up soon that you can keep track of. So uh, make some noise for this awesome, badass guys, woman of the industry. You. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like, like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.